as we do that, we've been looking and talking about several different things. Would you join me? Let's just look to the Lord again as we turn to his word uh, that uh, our hearts would be ready for his word and would be good ground. Lord, here we are, and we want to give you ground in our hearts, the soil of our hearts, that will receive the word of God and produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. We don't want it to be hard ground. We don't want it to be ground uh, where it springs up quickly, but there it's rocky soil. We don't want it to be ground where uh, the word of God is choked out by the weeds, which are the cares um, and the temptations of this life. But we want to give our hearts to you as good soil that uh, good things might happen in our lives and that every blessing you have for us, every good work, every promise for now and for the future will be fully realized in our hearts as we receive your word and as we respond in obedience and in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, I hope you will grab, I'll be putting most of the verses uh, up here on the screen, but I hope you will grab your Bibles as well, and you may want to get pen and paper, or <coughs> if you are pastor at uh, at at typing than I am. You can put it on your phones if you'd like to as well, but I usually need to write it. And I want to this morning uh, continue generally, although it's not the continuation of the series, the three-part series that we ended last week. It is in general a continuation of that because as I've been praying for the church and as I have considered what the Lord has for us as a church during this time where there are changes and also where there is where it is a transition time, uh, the Lord has words that he wants to speak to us. The Lord has a plan for us. Uh, the Lord does not say, oh, no, what are we going to do now? Um, the Lord always is perfectly in control and uh, perfectly in time, and he's never too early. He's never too late, and he always has a word and a message for us through our days. And so I want to continue with what I believe the Lord has put on my heart specifically for us as a church during these days and time of transition, we have been talking about in these last few weeks how we are being built into a house for the Lord. And uh, so I, I tried to choose something that was fairly appropriate. If your eyesight is poor, that's going to look like ants to you right now, gathered in a, uh, some of you who are here just put on your glasses. So if you look really closely, it's people, okay? And they are built into or they're gathered together into something that sort of resembles a church or a more traditional church structure, just to give us a, 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 a pictorial or a symbolic idea of what we're talking about. And um, as we've looked at 1 Peter chapter 2, we've talked about how God is building us uh, into a house for himself. He lives there by his spirit. We are built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, who is a sure foundation for us. And when we are built on him, we will never be disappointed. We will never be shaken. And how much we need that in these days of uh, COVID-19 and the new normal. I kind of hate that expression, don't you? It, it, it doesn't seem particularly helpful to us. Nevertheless, we are in such times. And so we have to know what what we do know, and that is that our Lord Jesus Christ is a sure foundation, and we need to, know, need to know who we are, as we talked about last week, as the people of God that were called by his name, and what that means, and what God has done to make us his own, just like the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, who were slaves in Egypt, no place to call their own, no national identity, no freedom, only subject to the bondage and the whims of a very cruel Pharaoh. And God sovereignly moved and he set his eyes upon them and he said, you are my people and I've seen what you're going through and I'm going to deliver you. I will break Pharaoh's hold on you. I will make you a nation and I'll give you a home. And that in the Old Testament is the physical picture of a spiritual reality that's far greater. In the same way, God has delivered us. He's delivered you. And he has made us his very own people. He's given us hope. And he's given us a home in himself. And he's made us people who reflect his glory. And individually he lives in us. 
And as a church, he brings us together in a mysterious way that's hard to understand, but he makes his home in us as a church, individually and personally, and also as a, as a church, his home. We didn't look at this scripture last week, but I want us to look at it now. And this is from Ephesians 2, 20 through 22. Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, and he again is saying the same thing that Peter is saying. Look with me. Together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. When he says the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, what he meant was what they preached about Jesus Christ, about the gospel. Um, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. And then he says, we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. I sometimes feel I don't deserve that. I don't qualify. But God is the one who says, I'm building you into a holy temple. And I'm joining you carefully together. Various translations here will say, uh, fitly joined together, I think is the, new, is the King James. And what it means there is that we're, we're joined, God joins us closely and, and, and we fit very well. It's not a loose building, but we, we fit very closely. And God puts us just where we fit. And the parts of us where we don't fit so well, he works on us until we do fit. And he brings us into his temple. And then... He says, because he's speaking to Gentiles, the Ephesian church was a Gentile church, not a Jewish church. And Paul says, through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Amen. And I think that's important for us because in the world of his time, there was no, there were no greater groups separate i didn't say that very well there were no more disparate groups than jews and gentiles they did not fit they did not match they did not click they didn't go together but paul inspired by the holy spirit says you jews and you gentiles god is bringing you together you fit how encouraging for you and for me and what a reminder for us that there is no place for division in the church of God. There's no place for distinction from one another in the church of God. We are who we are. We are our nationalities. But God brings us together in Christ. In Christ. What unites us? Jesus unites us. What identifies us and sets us apart from other people? Jesus does. You and I, as Jesus works in us and builds us into his temple, should feel more at home with other Christians than we do with people from our own cultural and ethnic backgrounds. We are the family of God. We are the church of God. What identifies us? What sets us apart from other people and together with certain people? Jesus does. What distinguishes us? Jesus does. If you'll remember, I've told you this example. Uh, I think it's been a long time, maybe years since I've mentioned this. Many years ago when I was still a teenager and living in the U.S., I had gone with my mom uh, shopping in the next town over from where we lived. And uh, we were just walking around the store. And my mother was not praying. She wasn't whispering prayers under her breath. She wasn't singing. She didn't wear a cross. It wasn't, I think she was looking at clothes. And she was, as she was walking around and I was walking near her and the sales lady in the store looked at her, one of the sales ladies looked at her and said, you're a Christian, aren't you? Just like that. And my mom said, I sure am. And mom looked at her and she said, and you are too, aren't you? And the lady says, yes, ma'am, I am. And there was an instant connection. What is it? Is it because we are so holy and we have a glow about us and there's a, a, a vague halo, uh, whatever? No, brothers and sisters. What makes us different, what makes us special is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is in us and he manifests through us. And I know that we don't always feel like that as we push through MTR crowds and as we go here and there. But there is something in us that as the Lord works in us, and makes us more and more his home. 
that we are to be distinguished from the world around us because he lives in us and he's making us his holy temple where he lives by his spirit. Um, and so uh, as we look at that, remember what we talked about last week. Uh, the New Testament in the, is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New revealed. And as we look at this truth, uh, I want to look again at some of the words of Moses as he was talking with God one day. And I want to use the example again of Moses and the children of Israel. This was after um, Israel had really blown it. They had stumbled so badly. Moses had been up on Mount Sinai with the Lord, communing with him and getting the, uh, uh, getting the, the, te the commandments and the laws by which God's chosen people would live and outwardly be distinguished from the nations around them. And they had blown it so badly, they were just like the nations around them. They had engaged in idolatry. They had then gotten into, uh, it was the worship of Egypt that they had, that the Lord had brought them out of when they made golden calves. That was, that was one of the idols of Egypt. And then the type of idolatry they fell into was, was immorality even, just like the nations around them. And Moses was up on the mountain, mountain receiving the laws by which they would show that they were the people of God. And God was so angry with them. So one day, Moses is talking with God. And look with me as we're talking about this, as we're thinking about what makes us different, what sets us about, apart. And one day Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you'll send with me. You've told me I know you by name and I look favorably on you. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And then Moses says very boldly, remember that this nation is your very own people. You mean this nation that has just stumbled so badly and made themselves a laughingstock of the nations around them? Moses says, remember, this nation is your very own people. And here we are in the Old Testament, but I want to encourage you this morning because there are times when we as the children of God we stumble, we blow it, we fall. And if we're honest, we look at ourselves and we judge ourselves so harshly and we realize I'm no different from the people around me. Have you ever thought that about yourself when you've, when you've blown it, maybe when you've lost your temper, maybe when something has happened? I have, and I'm sure you have as well because we are people on a journey and we haven't reached the end yet. So God's still working in us and working on us. And we, we almost give up hope. But, na but Moses says to God, remember that this nation is your very own people. And I want to say something to you this morning. You are still God's very own people. God doesn't divorce you. God doesn't say, well, I don't want you anymore. But God does, he, does, he will do something about it. He will work in us to make us his people. And there's a key for us there when Moses says, you look favorably on me, but teach me your ways. Teach me your ways. And brothers and sisters, part of our Christian lives, it's just a process of being taught the ways of the Lord and, and getting it from here to here so that our lives really reflect that we are the people in the nation of God. And so then the Lord replied, my presence will go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. What distinguishes us from the people of the world around us? It's God with us, isn't it? Um, he says to us, I'm making you a holy temple where I live by my spirit. And so God says to Moses, my presence will go with you. And here's Moses so boldly. Uh, it's so encouraging to me. It's as if he already knows what Hebrews 4 says, that we may boldly and with confidence approach the throne of God. And Moses says to the Lord, if your presence does not go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know? that you are pleased with me and your people if you don't go with us. Wow, there's a lot there, isn't it? The presence of the Lord. He understands that what sets him apart and what sets them apart is the presence of the Lord. And it is a, it is a, a testimony. It's a witness to them. And it's a testimony to the people around us. God, what sets us apart is your presence with us not a set of rules, although God is working in us, obedience, 
but it's the presence of the Lord this morning. It was the presence of the Lord then. It is the presence of the Lord now. And then he says further, for your presence among us distinguishes your people and me from all other people on the earth. There are people this morning in this earth who do better things than I do. There are people in this world who do more benevolent things than you do this morning. All of these things. But what makes us different? It is what Moses said. Your presence among us distinguishes, sets us apart from all the other people on the earth. Here's the good answer, and here's the Lord's answer. I will indeed do what you have asked. Brothers and sisters, do you wonder and do you want to know what type of prayer the Lord always answers? This type of prayer. He will always answer. He will always respond. And so as we look ahead this morning and as we look at these, these scriptures, I want to encourage us as a church and give us um, more focus and direction as a church as we move ahead what the Lord has for us and the Lord's word to us. We Here we are in Hong Kong, but around the world in crisis. Society is in crisis right now. We hear the expression over and over again, the new normal. And, and we're still trying to figure out what the new normal is. There are people going through stressful times trying to figure out what are we going to do. Um, there are people that are pinning all of their hopes on a vaccine. Brothers and sisters, we have no idea when a vaccine is coming. We have no idea the efficacy of a vaccine. And I'm not talking politics or medicine. I'm just talking this is the way that the world is. We are, we, we are dealing with the same things that everyone around us is dealing with. We are going through the same things around us, but how are we dealing with it? And how are we going through these times, both now and as we look ahead as well? What sets us apart, what should set us apart, is the presence of the Lord with us. And when the Lord is with us, when the presence of the Lord is with us, then that makes all the difference. I am not talking about the omnipresence of the Lord. I'm not talking about the omnipresence. He's everywhere right now. He is here. He is there. He's in China. He's in the Philippines. He's in the U.S. I'm not talking about the omnipresence. I'm speaking of the manifest presence of the Lord, the palpable presence of the Lord, the transforming, transcendent presence of the Lord, that when he shows up, we know he's here. We know he is in our situation. We know he's in our lives. We know he is here with a purpose and a plan and a power to make a difference. This is what I'm talking about this morning. And I believe with all of my heart, because God has spoken this to my heart, that this is what he wants for us and purposes for us individually this morning. But it is also what he purposes for us as a church as well. I am thankful for Lighthouse and I know you are as well. But don't you think and don't you hope that the Lord has more for us? I believe he does. I believe he does. The manifest presence of the Lord. So we are doing more than listening to a message. So we are doing more than singing songs. So we are doing more than, yes, putting my offering in the offering bag but that we are worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth and our hearts and our lives are lifted and transformed, that we're receiving the living anointed word of God and things happen, that we're giving back to the Lord and something miraculous happens with the offerings and the tithes that we give to him, the manifest presence of the Lord. This is what he has for us. It's not a set of rules and a set of laws, but as Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't send us up from this place. Go with us, God. Go with us, God. And this is the prayer that our God loves to answer. And so as we go forward this morning, we're going to be looking at and talking about presence and prayer. The people of God. The people of God. When the presence of God is manifest in our lives, things happen. Circumstances change. Now let's go back. We're talking about Moses and we're talking about the children of Israel and that gives us a very clear picture um, of a physical truth back then that makes a difference in our lives. And so Paul, uh, P 
not Paul and not Peter. They weren't anywhere around yet. It was Moses still. But Moses is speaking to the children of Israel. And look with me. This is in Deuteronomy 4. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. And so Moses is reminding them of some things that God did in the past. And he's reminding them of what he is getting ready to do. Look with me. Moses says to the children of Israel, God's nation, God's people, because he loved your forefathers, he chose their descendants after them. Those are the people he's speaking to right now. And he brought you out of Egypt. How? Look with me. Have you ever noticed this before? How did God bring them out of Egypt? By his presence and his great power. When the presence of the Lord is manifest, there is always his power. There is always his power to move and to work. And he brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great power to drive out before you nations greater and stronger than you and to bring you in and to give you their land as an inheritance as is now taking place. How did God bring them out? By his presence and power, clearing a way before them over nations greater and stronger to bring them in and give them a land. Listen, don't get upset with thinking, well, God, you stole somebody's land and you gave it to your favorites, Israel. We've, I, I won't even say that. <laughs> That's close to gossiping. But anyhow, don't get upset about that because this was not their land. The Canaanites and the inhabitants go back in the Bible 400 plus years and what you will hear and what you will see is God said to Abraham, Abraham, I give you this land. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Get ahead of me here and start thinking not just about Egypt and thinking about the promised land, but what God has for you, his nation, for you, his people. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And God says to his nation and his people, he says it to Abraham, Abraham, I give this to you as an inheritance and to your descendants. God's not stealing land from anybody. It's an inheritance. It's God's. And he's giving it to his people. The people that were there were squatters. It was God's land. It belonged to God's people. Now, here's a spiritual truth for you and for me this morning. Here's a spiritual truth for us. The devil is camping on land that God has promised to you as his nation, as his people. It's been promised to you by God. He cannot have your family. He cannot have your children. He cannot have your finances. He cannot have your marriage. He cannot have your future. He can't have these things. Why? He's promised them to you as his people, as his nation, as his children. The devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's a squatter, and he will want to make you think, I'm greater than you, and I'm mightier than you, just like all of those Canaanites in the land as the children of Israel were getting ready to go in. Remember when they started to go in? They said, oh, there are giants in the land. Listen, there are giants in the land that is your inheritance as well. Those giants are bigger than you. But the presence of the Lord goes with you. And there are no giants bigger than our God. There are no squatters on territory promised to you that can stand against the presence of the Lord. Stand and fight because the presence of the Lord is with you. He cannot have these things that he's trying to hold on to when you are the people of God and God has promised them to you. That deserves a huge amen right now. As the Lord revealed that and, and, and opened my eyes, I had not seen it in that way before. I was, I was sitting there working at my desk and I, was, uh, and I was like, amen, 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 Lord, amen. I was so, so encouraged because there are areas in, in my life and in the church as well that I still think, God, there's more, there's more. But it seems like there, there's a bondage and there are things that are held here. But God, help us as we move ahead, the presence of the Lord. And we're talking about this morning how this becomes, how this is worked out in our lives and in our situations. When God shows up, things happen. Amen? Things happen. But how does God show up? How does God show up? Let's look at 
uh, let's look at some verses that, that show us how God shows up in our lives. He's making us into his holy temple as a church. He's making us a house where he lives by his spirit. But at times we don't feel this reality. When was the last time you and I in our lives or in the church truly experienced the manifest presence of God in such a way that drove out the enemy and brought victory into our lives? In, in the manifest presence of God in a way that transforms us, that lifts us up, that breaks bondages and chains, that breaks depression off of our lives, that baptizes in the Holy Spirit. This is God's inheritance for us as the nation of God, as the people of God. Some of you with children in your families, there are burdens that you have and you look at your children or your marriages or other things or maybe your finances or your business or these things and it's such a burden on your heart because it, you feel like, God, I'm, I'm losing ground in this area. Uh, the, the, you may not even think of it as the devil taking over, but there's no victory in those areas. How does God show up in these areas of our lives? The Bible tells us. The Bible tells us. Don't we long for our lives to be distinguished from everyone else around us by his presence? Deuteronomy 4.7 the words of Moses again, look with me. Have you read this before? I know you have because you've read Deuteronomy, but has it registered with us before? Look at this. Moses says, For what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on him? Here's the key for us, brothers and sisters. What nation, what other nation, what other people has a God as near to them as the Lord our God. Isn't that encouraging this morning? There's nobody else on this world that has a God like ours that is near to us as when we call on him, when we call on the name of the Lord. And as we're going to see this morning, when, when it talks about calling on the Lord, it is not just little help here, God. Uh, I don't think God loves us, but I don't know how much weight and how much pull that carries with the Lord. Um, but here we have this beautiful picture of how our Lord God is near to us whenever we call on him. And then yeah, it's, it's repeated again in the Psalm of David in Psalm 145. It's verse 18. Again, the Lord is near to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. Much more than, oh God, I need a little help. Lord, I've gotten 80% of this problem worked out, but I need you for, the, for 20%. Would you help me with that 20%? Brothers and sisters, I don't think that's the type of calling on the Lord that Moses is talking about or that David is talking about. And yet, if we're honest with one another and with God, we would say that a lot of times our calling on the Lord is exactly like that, isn't it? We pray a little bit and then we get busy and then we go off and worrying and we start figuring out. We've prayed, but now how can I solve this problem? How can I figure it out? And, and we take this burden to the Lord because we know what the Bible says, right? Cast your burdens onto Jesus for he cares for you. He will carry that burden. And so we come with our burden. As one preacher said, we come with our burden. We say, okay, Lord, here it is. Well, okay, Lord, if you're not going to pick it up, I'll, I'll carry it on <laughs> as well. I don't think this is the type of prayer and the calling on the Lord that we're reading here. So what does it mean? What does it look like to call on him and to have him come near, to have his presence manifest in such a way that the enemy around us that's greater than we are is pushed back, is cast out, and releases the inheritance that is ours as God's nation and God's people. Well, we've got an Old Testament example, and you've heard me speak about it in the last few weeks, and that's with King Jehoshaphat. It's in Second Chronicles. What a wonderful story. And uh, maybe sometime in the future we're going to come back to this. But here's King Jehoshaphat. The nation of Israel is divided. There are the ten northern tribes and the northern kingdom, and then there, uh, is the, then there are the lower two tribes, and that's called Judah, and that's where Jerusalem is. And Judah continued to follow the Lord longer than the northern tribes did. So here's Jehoshaphat. He's a godly king. He's following the Lord. He calls on the Lord. And suddenly he receives the news that there are three great armies marching against him and God's people. And he and all the nation, men, women, and children, because they are desperate, 
gather before the Lord in prayer and in fasting. And this gives us a picture of how desperate they were. Because you know what? In those days, if a great army was coming against you, there was no mercy for any prisoner. There was no mercy for any woman. There was no mercy for any child. Let me say something to you this morning. Your enemy is a hateful and horrible enemy. He never has a good day. He will never show mercy. That's why we've got to call on God. That's why we've got to call on him. And so all of them, they're desperate. We read, Jehoshaphat was afraid. That encourages me because sometimes I get a little bit afraid too. But there's an antidote to fear. Um, when, when, you, when we get afraid, don't say, oh, no, I'm such a bad Christian. I'm afraid. Instead, do what Jehoshaphat did. What does it say? He resolved to seek the Lord. He determined, God, I'm going to go after you. He proclaimed a fast for all of Judah who gathered to seek the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek him. And then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the Lord's temple before the courtyard, and he prayed. Do you think his prayer was, oh God, little help? Do you think all of these men, women, and children, knowing what they faced, were like, God, come on now, we need your help. You're going to have to help us here. No, we see in their fasting, we see in their resolve, we see in their uh, unity the determination of their hearts to call upon the Lord until his manifest presence came. Now, this is a little bit long, but I want to read it because the prayer, we're only going to read part of the prayer, but it's too good not to read. Look with me. He says, Lord God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, and no one can stand against you. You see, brothers and sisters, when we don't know how to pray, you can't do much better than the prayers of the Bible. Sometimes I pray this, power and might, God, it's in your hands. All of this belongs to you. When you and I face an army bigger than we know how to conquer, we look to our Lord. It all belongs to him. And he says, then he says, he, remi he remembers uh, the promise of God from the past. Oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in the land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? See, that's a reminder, isn't it? When you and I face things and we say, oh, God, look at this that's coming. If it stands against the purposes of God in your life, if it stands against the promise of God in your life, if it stands against the inheritance of God in your life, you stand up and stand with God and declare God's truth. Declare God's truth. This is what God has promised. And, and Jehoshaphat remembers that and he prays that. And then he says, they have lived, the Israelites, they've lived in the land and have built a sanctuary in it for your name. And they have said, whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, judgment, or famine, we will come to stand in your presence, aha, ding, 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 right? Before, your, before this temple where your name is honored, we will cry out to you to save us and you will hear and deliver us. Jehoshaphat understood that the presence of the Lord as they came into his presence and he manifest himself that there would be an answer for them, that God would hear such a prayer. God would answer such a prayer. This morning, let me ask you something. Are you in war? Is there turmoil in your life or in your family? Is there plague? Is there sickness? Are there things? All of us feel that. Is there judgment? And you say, judgment, but I'm the child of God. We can go through times of discipline from the Lord for choices that we have made. And I want you to see this this morning. Even when there is the discipline of the Lord in our lives, there is still the love of the Lord that brings deliverance and brings us hope and brings us help in those times. Or if there's famine, are some of you this morning struggling with a lack in your lives or in your family, finances or job or things like that? When that is true in your lives, come before the presence of the Lord. Look to him and say, oh God, did you not give this as an inheritance? Call upon the name of the Lord. We will cry out to you to save us, and you will hear and deliver us. Be encouraged this morning, O oh, people of God, O oh, church of God, O oh, lighthouse family. And then 
He continues to pray, and then he says, Now here are the Ammonites, Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir. Here they are. And then he says, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this vast multitude that comes to fight against us. Brothers and sisters, this gets our priority right. This sets us straight. This battle that we think we're facing, this enemy that we think we are facing, it is not ours to fight. We fight in prayer. Get on your knees and fight in prayer. Stand before the Lord and fight in prayer. And then let the Lord do the battle against an enemy that is bigger and mightier than you because he's not bigger and mightier than the Lord your God who has given this land as an inheritance to you. It is yours. This is the promise and the word of God. This is the type of prayer that God hears. This is the type of prayer that God answers. And then he ends it by saying, you've heard me preach about this a few weeks ago. He says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. God, we have no plan B. We have no plan C. We have no plan D. If you don't come and manifest your presence, we're sunk. We're doomed. This is the prayer that God answers. And in the midst of their desperate cry to the Lord, the word of the Lord comes forth from somebody, from one of the, one of the people that are assembled there. And this is what he says from the Lord. Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King, Je uh, listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. And then verse 17, you do not have to fight this battle. Oh, beloved, are you worn out from trying to fight some battles? They're not yours to fight. They're the Lord's to fight. Fight in prayer. Do battle on your knees. Do battle in your prayer closet before the Lord. And then... Don't be afraid. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you. There's the presence of the Lord. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Tomorrow, go out and face them, for the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. There again, the presence of the Lord. And there's more there. You're going to have to read it on your own in Second Chronicles 20. But let me just add this verse. So encouraging. And then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah. Do you know who they were? They were the worship leaders, Brother Chris, and the worship team that's here. They were the worship leaders. That's why the worship team in Lighthouse, it's so important that we have a fresh touch from the Lord because we lead people. The Lord touches our hearts and we lead people in victory. I'm pretty sure that their reply was not scripted. It came from their hearts, wasn't it? They stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Oh, brothers, I want to get to the place where we hear the word of the Lord. Stand still and see that the Lord's going to fight for you. Don't be afraid. Oh, there's going to may a loud shout of victory rise from our hearts and from our families as well. This is the kind of calling on the name of the Lord that brings him near to us. God, it's you or it's nothing. God, it's your battle or it's my defeat. But God answers this prayer. God comes near when his people call upon him in such a way. This is the Old Testament example. And let me give you a New Testament example very quickly. And you know this one already because I spoke about it when we were looking at, when we were studying Acts. Uh, and we're going to get back to Acts before too long. It's Acts chapter 12. But you remember this one. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, when Herod Agrippa is king and the church is growing and Herod uh, arrests James, the brother of John, and he kills him. The Bible says he kills him by the sword. What that means is, as far as we know, uh, he cut off his head. And the Jews are pleased. And Herod Agrippa looks at their wicked glee and joy over the beheading of a godly man. And he, and he thinks to himself, hey, this is great. I can gain more favor by cutting off another head of another disciple. And so he arrests Peter. And so 
we read in Acts 12, then he imprisoned him, Peter, placing, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. So what it would have been, uh, four squads of four soldiers, so there would have been, uh, they would have been in shifts um, throughout the day. So there would have been two people in the cell with Peter, and we'll read that, that, that are chained to him, and then there would have been two standing guard. This is not even all the other uh, soldiers in the, se- in, the, uh, in the prison. This is just for Peter. Um, and so he imprisoned him, placing him under guard. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. Verse 5, here's the, here's the key. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly to God for him. Let's look at that again. The church prayed very earnestly to God for him. What type of prayer? How were they calling on God? This says very earnestly, or some of your translations will say fervently, unceasingly, constantly. The word, listen to this, literally means someone that is fully stretched out as far as he can be stretched, all his muscles, fully stretched out, that type of prayer. It's the same word that Luke, who writes, who is inspired to write the gospel, the, the uh, book of Acts, uses to describe Jesus as he was praying in the garden the night before his crucifixion. Earnestly, this type of full stretching, that means everything was in that prayer. So while Peter's in prison, the church was earnestly praying. They didn't stop to pray. What is our attitude in prayer? Let me ask, because we, 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 we're talking about prayer and presence, and we're, we want, we're talking about calling on God, but sometimes we call on God a little bit, and then we kind of go on our way when it seems God doesn't show up, right? That's not what the church did. They were earnestly, unceasingly stretched out as far as they could stretch, and brothers and sisters, as I say this, I, I, I walk humbly and I speak humbly before you because I don't know all of the answers. There are some of us this morning who pr- have prayed in this way before, haven't we? And the answer that came was not the answer that we wanted. And God knows these things and he takes us through these things. Nevertheless, we are called to pray in such a way. Sometimes we pray in such a way that we want God to care more about it than we do, don't we? Okay, okay God, you got it. Um, God still loves us, but God is looking for the person. God is looking for the church that will earnestly grab onto him in prayer, stretched out. God, no plan B if you don't show up. It doesn't persuade a reluctant God, but it demonstrates that our hearts are passionately committed in this affair, and in this matter. And when we pray in this way, the words of Jesus are are fulfilled. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. That's this type of prayer. And I want you to see also, and you say, well, that's a no-brainer, Pastor. Of course, the church prayed to God for him. Well, who are you going to pray to? Of course we pray to God. But let me underline this. I think sometimes we pray almost casually, please don't misunderstand me, or we pray in such a way that we, um, that it is, it's, it's, uh, we have lost a sense of we're really entering into and before our mighty God. The, we're entering into his presence and he's the Lord God of heaven and earth and he has all power. This is the God to whom we pray. We're coming into his presence. And so we know the answer, don't we? We know what happens When everything else is locked and everything else is closed, the gate of heaven is always open, isn't it? The gate of heaven is always open. So on the night before Herod was to bring him out for execution, it's certain, by the way, uh, Peter has no pull with Herod. The church has no pull with Herod. Come on, give us a favor. Herod wasn't interested in that. There was nothing that the church could do or to appeal to Herod that would cause Herod to change his mind. They had no money. They had no standing. They had no authority. They had no power of any sort. Herod's going to bring him out for execution. Peter's sleeping between the soldiers bound with chains. Sentries are on the front door. The angel of the Lord suddenly appears, hits him and wakes him up. 
Obviously, Peter was in a deep sleep because when the angel says to him, quick, get up, uh, the idea almost is uh, Peter is awakened out of a deep sleep. Have you ever been awakened out of a really deep sleep and your brain was fuzzy? You're kind of like, <laughs> you know, I have. It's kind of like, huh? <laughs> huh? I think that's what is described here. Um, and that's why, that's why the angel says, quick, get up. He's not like, quick, we got to get out of here before they discover us. Hey, an angel appears in the cell. He can make all those soldiers asleep as long as he wants to. That's the, that, that's the point. And the chains fall off. And the angel says, get dressed. That's because Peter was in a deep sleep, right? He was really out of it. And then he has to tell, tell him what to do. Parents, do you ever have to tell your children what to do when you get them out of bed? Get up, brush your teeth, wash your face, put on your shoes, get ready. Sometimes we do, don't we? Um, he says, put on your sandals, wrap your cloak around you. Why? Get ready, boys. We're going outside. Isn't that encouraging? Getting ready for the further miracle that is yet ahead. You know, if God had wanted to, he could have just, just like that, transported Peter from the cell to, uh, to where the prayer meeting was taking place. But isn't it kind of great? He performs miracle, 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 miracle there. I, to me, that's really encouraging because we see the hand of God in this way. And Peter, bless his heart, um, thinks it's a dream or a vision. He doesn't even know it's real until they pass through the first and second guard posts. They came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. You and I can bang and bang and bang and push against the doors that are closed to us. But when the presence of God shows up, every door opens. And that's what we want in our lives. And that's what we want in our church. And then Peter realizes it. And then he goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where they're still praying. Why are they still praying? Because they haven't seen Peter released yet, nor have they seen his headless body um, after he's been executed by Herod. So they keep on praying. And here's a lesson for us, brothers and sisters. If the answer has not yet come, you keep praying. You keep praying that the manifest presence of the Lord will show up for his presence to be manifest. You may not have noticed this before as we come to a close this morning. Uh, I think we'll, we'll come back to this. I, I want to be, I think the Lord has put on my heart, we're going to be talking more about praying and calling on the name of the Lord. And I don't want us to be discouraged, but I want us to be encouraged in this because I believe God has good things ahead for us individually and in Lighthouse if we will call on his name for his presence to be manifest in our lives and in our families and in our church. Before the church was first called Christians, do you know how they were described? You will find it in Acts chapter 9. They were described as those who call on his name. Brothers and sisters, is this how you can be described this morning? Is this how Lighthouse can be described this morning? I say this not to discourage anyone, not to, not to make anyone feel guilty. I say this as a word from God for us this morning, that if we will be people who call on his name, he will come near. His presence will be manifest. And, oh, God, will take back the territory that he has promised us as an inheritance. God will defeat the enemies in our lives that are greater than we are. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. Chris is going to come and lead us in one more song of worship. Just come on up, Chris and Ying, if you will come up as well. But just um, even as you're coming, just pray with me. Let's pray together. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? What he has said to you, say back to him and respond to him in prayer this morning. And as we sing, it's not to sing a song. It is to respond to the Lord. It's to respond to the Lord. If you're part of the small group here this morning, I invite you to stand with me this morning. I invite you to stand. If you're at home, if you want to, just to change posture, May I encourage you, you may want to kneel this morning.
you may want to stand. You may want to lift your hands to the Lord. If you're with a group or with your family, you may want to hold the hand of a husband or a wife or a children or your children and look to the Lord this morning in prayer. I'm just going to pray briefly, and then Chris is just going to lead us in worship to the throne room of God as we call upon his name. Our Lord, our mighty God, the ruler of heaven and earth in whose hands are all power, and to, and and you have given to us as an inheritance all of these things ahead of us. Oh God, we want to be people who call upon your name. This is how we want to be distinguished, not by rules, not by a set of do's and don'ts, but oh God, oh God. May we be people who call on your name without a plan B or C or D. Only one plan, plan A, God, you alone. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Lord, for our families, Lord, for our finances, Lord, for our work, Lord, for our rebellious children, Lord, for our broken marriage, Lord, for the bondage that holds us. Oh, God, we call upon you. And we call upon you until your manifest presence comes. We will be stretched out in prayer until you come and deliver and bring us into the inheritance that you have for us. May we be people. May we be a church that calls on your name.